Hallelujah. Praise God. Gentlemen, are we having new converts tonight at five? Okay. Five o'clock. Yes. And how many have not yet taken the spiritual growth classes that are offered every Sunday at five. Don't be afraid. I'm not going to pick on you. Have you not taken it yet? So, am I the only one? Oh, okay. There's two of us. All right. So anyway, uh, uh, if you would, please, I'd love to have you join the class at five. Brother Jafrida does an awesome job across the street in our educational building. Every Sunday at five, he starts with level one. Level one is designed to build a foundation. It doesn't take you a long way into some things, but it gives you a solid foundation. It doesn't put things into your mind and heart that you're not ready to receive, but it puts the things that you need to build upon. And then level two builds upon level one. And together with those two classes, I think you have a most, most excellent opportunity to make it to thrive and live for God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. I'm going now to the word of the Lord. And I would ask you if you would bring your Bible, if you have it. And if not, then you can look up on the screen. And we're going to put a verse of scripture. Genesis chapter 19, verse 17. That's on the screen behind me as well, if you need it. All right. Here we go. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And this morning, for just a few moments, with your help, I would like to speak on this subject, escape. Would you all say it with me, please? Escape. escape. Praise God. Please don't try to make an escape while I'm trying to preach. You may be seated. Hallelujah. After 22 days of searching, investigators finally brought to a close the search for Richard Matt, age 48. And David Sweat, age 35. The convicted murderers who escaped from a New York prison. Most of you will remember the drama that unfolded this past year. Matt is dead. Sweat is in custody with gunshot wounds. And the two prisoner workers who helped them in connection with their escape, have been charged. You will remember that it was June the 6th, 2015, when officials discovered convicted killers Richard Matt and David Sweat were missing from their cells about 5.30 one morning. Their escape was the first from the maximum security section of the Danamora, New York prison since it opened 150 years ago. The escapees used power tools to cut holes in the back of their cells. And I've still wondered to this day how they could have been using power tools to cut holes in the back of their cells and no one heard them. They made their way through the innards of the prison and climbed out of a manhole a block away. At least 250 local, state, and federal officials, including FBI agents and United States Marshals, set up checkpoints in the area surrounding the prison, which, by the way, is less than 20 miles from the Canadian border. A $50,000 reward was offered. Residents near the prison were fearful and were forced to leave their homes as the manhunt intensified. Well, Joyce Mitchell, she was 51, an instructor in the prison tailor shop where Matt and Sweat worked, was arrested in connection with the escape. Police say she checked herself into the hospital with, quote, a case of the nerves, end of quote, 
the day Matt and Sweat made their getaway. You see, Joyce Mitchell had planned to drive the getaway vehicle, but she got scared and chickened out. Didn't meet at the agreed upon rendezvous. She had agreed to drive them to Mexico, but when she didn't show up, they were forced to flee on foot. And if you know anything about that part of New York, it is very dense, dense forest. Exactly like the type of forest we have here in Maine. Richard Matt was fatally shot in the town of Malone on June 26, after nearly three weeks of being on the lam. And David Sweat was shot and captured just a few days later on June 28. I, I know that it captured the attention of a lot of people, but I just have this idea that it captured especially the attention of people living here in Augusta when you consider the fact that Malone is only 300 miles west of our city. Due west, just 300 miles where the last one was captured. I have your attention now and I want to talk to you just a few moments about escape. It was in the days of the man whom the Bible simply calls Lot that there is recorded in the Holy Writ this unusual story. It is so unusual, matter of fact, that Jesus in the gospel according to Luke 1,931 years later referred back to this true story of Lot and indicated that people were going about their daily business. In the day of Lot, they were eating and drinking, they were buying and selling, they were farming and building, and life was going on at a fairly normal clip for the people who lived in the twin metropolis of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Bible tells us this little story, a very true story. It says that it came, there came two angels at Sodom at evening. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing these angels, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold, now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry or wait all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, No, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. And before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot, and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. And he said, I, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known men. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. And do you to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. And they, the angels, said, stand back. And they said again, excuse me, not the angels, the men of the city said, stand back. And they said again, this fellow came in to sojourn. He came in to travel from his travels, and now he will needs be a judge, or he's turned himself into a, a judge, a critic. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men, the angels, put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou any here besides... Son-in-law, sons, daughters, whatsoever you have in the city, bring them out of this place, 
For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out. Now folks, I'm going to stop reading here just for a moment. Can you imagine? Here's all these people. They're involved in horrible sins as we know. And society has decayed. The culture has been in decay for a while. And people have just got to the point where they accept everything and anything. No matter what the behavior may be, it's okay. Their deal was, don't criticize anybody. Let everybody do whatever they think is right. For, they said, what's right for you may not be right for me. And what's right for me may not be right for you. And everybody is an individual. Does that sound familiar? Anything is excusable and there's no right and wrong. It's all up to the individual. After all, this right and wrong stuff is just judgmental thinking on the part of those who believe the word of God. And so Lot went out. Now, I have to tell you that you have to think about the time that this is taking place. They have already had supper. The sun has gone down. I don't know what time of night, but it's night. And the angel has just pulled Lot in. They've got Lot pressed up against the door with their hands encircling his throat. And they are telling him, we're going to do worse to you than we intended to do to those two men that came in your house. And the angel simply reaches out, grabs Lot, pulls him into the house, and then with one sweep of the hand, causes this mob of men to go stone blind. Now, if you were stricken with blindness, I would think that you as a conscientious as a rational human, the first thing that you would probably do would be, oh God, if you'll give me back my sight. I can't imagine what it would be like to be blind. I think sometimes we forget how blessed we are. So all of a sudden these people went from perfectly seeing individuals to totally blind individuals. And if you were stricken with blindness, if you are a rational person, and you realize that this big guy in shining apparel has just swept his hand and you've become blind, you would say, oh, that must have been an angel and I have done wrong. Father, forgive me, I have sinned. But these people had degraded so far that when the <coughs> angel of judgment swept his hand and they all became blind, Instead of saying, Father, forgive me, the Bible said they wearied themselves trying to find the door where those men are. Got to find the door. They don't even realize that they're so, they have so degraded that they don't care about the blindness. They just want to go on with what they had planned to do. And they're searching for the door. The angel with disgust written upon their faces turns to Lot and said, sir, yes, do you have any sons-in-law, daughters, or family members that you love? We tell you, go get them. Now, the Bible just simply says Lot went out, but I want to tell you what really happened. He went out on the fly. He went out running. The angel has just said, we are going to destroy this city. And if you can imagine the love that you have for your family and how your heart would lurch when the angel of the Lord looks you in the eye and says, if you got anybody in this city you love, go get them because we're going to destroy this city. You're not going to sit there and say, well, let me finish my cup of coffee and then I'm going to go after them. 
that he went running out into the night to do what he had not done. Listen, there's no one that would contest that Lot was a righteous man. But Lot was a man whose priorities were a little bit messed up. He'd become a very important man in the community, but he hadn't talked to his kids. He'd become a very wealthy person in his community, but he had not shared his faith with his children. And there's something in the Word of God that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words that I command thee shall be in thy heart, and you shall teach them diligently unto your children. And you're to speak of them when you're walking in the way, when you get up in the morning, when you go to bed at night. You are to make sure that your kids know that I am the Lord. So Lot, while he was sitting in the gates, which meant that he was at City Hall, basically, and he was somebody that had made something of himself, yet when the angel said, tonight, we have come to destroy this city, Lot lost it. He jumps up and screaming, he goes tearing out of the house and he runs down the street and now we read the following story. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Folks, what that means in common English is, they thought he was telling a joke. They thought he was joking. He had never said anything like this to them before, obviously. But at this point, he's saying, there's an angel at my house. And they're going, right. Matter of fact, there's two angels at my house. Right. And they're going to destroy this city. Right. And you got to go with me tonight. I don't care if it's midnight. Right. Well, don't stand there and stare at me. Come on, get my babies and get your, your wife and follow me. Right. And the Bible says that they looked at him and they thought he was joking. He, the Bible says that, that he seemed as one that mocked. There are some times that our message may not be believed if we wait too late. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. Am I reading now the Bible? Yeah, I, I am. This is not a sci-fi. This, this is not a comic book. This is the word of God. When the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in, in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, while Lot hesitated, while Lot drug his feet, while Lot waited, dallied, the men, the angels, laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. Now, now can you imagine this? Two big burly angels have just grabbed Lot and his wife, and their two single daughters are still at home. And they have literally dragged them out of the city. The cities in those days, remember, were walled cities. And so they dragged them, the angels dragged them out of the city. And when they get outside of the walls, it came to pass when they had brought them forth that he, the angel, said, Notice. Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou on all the plain. Escape to the mountain, 
lest thou be consumed. Now, folks, we're reading a historical account of something that really happened one day many, many years ago. The angel said, flee for your lives. Hey, flee for your lives. This is not just something that is going to be a better thing for you, and that's why we're wanting you to get out of this city. This is not just going to be a more precious lifestyle for you. No, no, we want you to flee from this city. And they said, don't look back and don't stop. Get out of this city because judgment is coming. And they said, don't even look back. Once you start on your escape from this damned city, once you start on your escape from the city that is headed toward judgment of God, don't look back and forevermore, don't stop. You know, I see some people who start to do the right thing and then they start reflecting. Hmm. Well, hmm. And mentally they're looking back. I see some folks who start to escape and then they say, hmm, well, I suppose it's not all that urgent today. I guess today I'll do something Else, maybe I'll stop. But the angel said, flee to the mountains, lest thou be consumed. Flee to escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Get out of Dodge. Go to the mountain, or you will be swept away. Listen. In Lot's case, it was not outright rebellion against God. It was not a plan to live an exceeding sinful life that most threatened Lot's family. It was not that at all. It was his lingering. It was his hesitation that nearly did Lot and his entire family in. This is the way it is with lots of people. I meet people all the time who plan to do the right thing. They're planning. As a matter of fact, I meet very few people who are hope, openly hostile to God and say, mm, forget it, I'll never live for God. Most people that I talk to will say, you know, I believe that there's a God and one of these days i got to check this out. One of these days I'm going to try to do what's right. One of these days, the only problem is procrastination is the devil's chloroform. What gets most people is not how evil they are, it's how much they linger. It's not how evil they are, it's how much they procrastinate. It's not how evil they are, it's because they keep saying, yes, that's a good thing. I'm going to join that church. I'm going to get involved. I I'm going to be born again tomorrow. People have, as it were, a sixth sense that was put there by their creator. Now, you may not have any form of religious training, and you don't have to have, and sometimes you're better off if you haven't had. But every one of us have an innate sixth sense of God. You can go to the most primitive culture, and you're going to find people who are worshiping something. You can go to the most educated culture and you'll find people who are worshiping something. Man will worship something even if he doesn't know what to worship or who to worship because I will tell you that there is an innate sixth sense that was placed in you called the soul. That every man was created with a God-shaped vacuum. Somewhere in that physical body. There is also a spiritual body called the soul. The soul loves, it thinks, it enjoys. The soul is the you outside of the body. Some of you have heard of people who have had near-death experiences. And I've heard many times as a pastor, people say, pastor, I saw my body lying on the table. And then I heard somebody say, in Jesus' name, and I was back in my body, and I heard the doctor say, we got him back. There is a you that's going to live forever. 
There is a you that's called the soul. And whether you've had any formal religious training or not is immaterial. What is true is, is that God is placed in each and every one of your consciousness. Whether it be conscious or subconscious, God has placed something inside of you that says there is a creator. There is a God. There is somebody that I'm going to have to answer to one day. There is somebody that I'm going to give an account to one day. There is somebody that came at Bethlehem and was born. There is somebody that died on the cross at Calvary. There is somebody that resurrected on the third day. And I may not know him real well, but I sense that he is real. And God put that in you when you were created. Many have had events, situations are happening somewhere along the way where God was involved and maybe you realized it later. Some of you have been miraculously saved from death. Some of you, I know your stories and I know some of you how that God has most miraculously intervened on your behalf. And if I were to allow you, some of you could get up and tell stories how that but for the mighty hand of God, you wouldn't be here today. And according to Hebrews 13, some have entertained angels without knowing it. The Bible says that some have entertained angels unawares. And, and I will tell you that as we get closer to the coming of the Lord, this is going to happen more and more often. Because remember, Jesus said, as it were, in the days of Lot... That would be how it was when Jesus would come back. And in the days of Lot, angels were greatly involved. But in Lot's case, it was lingering hesitation that destroyed some of his family and almost destroyed him. You see, in Lot's day, there was no time for loitering. The angels gave their warning one evening. And the very next morning, the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were on fire. Get it. One evening, the angels said, if you got anybody here you love, get them out. The next morning, Sodom and Gomorrah were on fire. There was no time for hesitation. Now, I want to read from the words of Christ. In Luke 17, 28, likewise, likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Hold on. This is not some right-wing fanatical conspiracist standing here in this pulpit this morning reading from some right-wing conspiracist theory book. But I'm reading from the words of none other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who said just like it was in Lot's day when it was something that happened the same day that Lot went out of Sodom. It rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Jesus said, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now I know the devil does not want you to hear what I'm saying this morning. But whether you hear it or not, you're responsible for it. Whether you hear it or not, it's not going to change. It's still going to happen. All I can hope is that somehow the Spirit of God would wake up those who are sleeping and slumbering spiritually. You may be one of the best dudes who ever walked or one of the best gals who ever lived, but you need to remember that the way that Lot almost lost everything was not by his evilness, it was by his procrastination. Is this true of today? Yes. The writer of Hebrews, and just stay there in Luke, but the writer in Hebrews also said, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? 
See, most people who miss the rapture will miss it because not of evil doing, but because of neglect. Hey, did you know you can be so busy doing stuff? You know, I read about a guy who was flying an airplane. And that always interests me because, you know what, I read all the accident reports that I can get my hands on because I want to make sure that if I can learn something about that accident, I don't want that happening to me. So I read these accident reports and I'm reading about this guy who's fiddling with this, this bulb. He's got a, a bulb burned out. And he's fiddling with it and he's trying to get it and boom! He flew right into the side of a mountain. Well, he's fiddling with this, this $2.50 light bulb and flying a million dollar airplane and a priceless soul. Well, he's fiddling with this little light bulb. He flew into the side of a mountain and he died that day. And I'm preaching to people today that if you're lost, more than likely it will not be because you're evil. It will be because you got distracted with the little things in life that were important, yes, but not nearly as important as your walk with God was. And you kept playing with a little $2.50 light bulb until you crashed into the side of a proverbial mountain. Now I think I've got your attention. And I know I got the devil's attention because he doesn't want you to hear what I'm saying. He doesn't want you to be saved. He doesn't want you to escape. He wants you to get so distracted and so busy with all the mundane things of life that when the big, big deal comes, you're not prepared for it. And so Jesus said, even thus, the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven, destroyed them all. It was quick, and even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And verse 31 says, in that day, Jesus says, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. And then Jesus says something that makes my hair kind of stand up and the goosebumps come up upon my back. He says three little words. He says, remember Lot's wife. And I'm going, oh my God. Remember Lot's wife. Why would Jesus have it printed indelibly into the gospel of Luke? That he wanted you to remember something that, it, by the way, when Jesus was talking, that was an event that had taken place over 1900 years before him. And suddenly he's looking like dreamily off into the distance and it's as though he sees something that nobody else can see. And he looks back at the people he's teaching and he says, remember Lot's wife. What are you trying to say? Are you trying to tell us that, that it's not good, that once you are given the opportunity to escape, don't look back? Right. Don't start looking back? And then he says, whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. D do you understand what he's saying? He's saying that if you grasp and cling to life on your terms, you'll lose it. But if you let that life go, you can receive eternal life on God's terms. No, sir, you're not in charge. No, ma'am, you are not in authority. No, you do not have power over your own ship. No, you do not. That's why you need a Savior. That's why I need a Savior. You can do everything right and still crash. You can do everything right and still crash and burn because you need a savior. You're not able to save yourself. Let a man take his bootstraps and, and hold on to him and jump up and down in the quicksand. But the more he jumps, the deeper he sinks into the quicksand until somebody from above says, I got a rope, grab on. I'm going to hook this around a tractor. This is going to hurt. Put this around your shoulders. But we're going to get you out of that sucking quicksand. And the only way you will get out is from the power above. The only way you will get out is from 
a helping hand that comes that is not in the quicksand. You cannot, no matter how good you are, save yourself. Because if you could, Jesus Christ died on the cross for nothing. But when he looked at you and realized that you were in an inescapable situation, Jesus said, angels, I'll be back. And he strode away from the throne, came down, was born as a baby, and walked among men and said, I'll pay the price so that you might be able to escape. So Jesus says in verse 34, I tell you in that night there shall be two men now, Brother Ferris, listen very carefully to what I'm going to say to you. All right? If you look at your King James Bible, which is the most accurate translation in the English, you'll notice that the word men is in italics. Which means this word was added by the translators for better readability. It was not in the original text. So when Jesus said it, he said, I tell you, in that night there shall be two in one bed. One shall be taken, and the other shall be left. In that night, two, again, women is in italics, shall be grinding, or grinding grain, or working in the kitchen, would be a modern translation. Together, one shall be taken, and the other left. Two shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Folks, do you understand the warning? Do you get the picture? Jesus is saying, when it's time for me to come, it will be as it were in Lot's day. The angels came one night. Sodom and Gomorrah was on fire the next morning. He said, it's going to be quick. It's going to be immediate. He said, I'm telling you, so you'll know, so you'll be aware. Don't wait until it's too late to prepare. He says, because when this time comes, two will be asleep in bed, and one will turn over and reach for the other one, and they're gone. Two will be at work, working on the job, and somebody will say, I need you to cut that limb right over there, and they're going to be gone. Two people will be in an airplane, one flight instructor and one student. And one shall be taken and the other left. There's going to be catastrophe that's going to come upon the world and it didn't need to be that way. If they had not hesitated... If they had not lingered, if they had not been so involved and, and all the stuff, they weren't bad. They just got so busy that God didn't even have a place in their life anymore. There was no time to pray. There was no time to read the Bible. There was no time to go to church. My God, we're doing all the important stuff. Don't you understand, God? We're doing important things. And God is shaking his head and saying, I'm telling you something, son. I'm telling you something, daughter that the day of my coming is now at hand. And when it takes place, it will be just like it was in the days of Lot. It's going to be so fast and so immediate that two women will be at work, or two will be at work, and one will be taken, the other left. Two will be asleep, one will be taken, the other left. Two in the field working. And I'm telling you t today that it's evening time right now. I, I think one of the saddest scriptures in the whole Bible... One of the saddest scriptures in the whole Bible is found in Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 20, where it says, The harvest is past, the summer is ended. And we are not saved. I will tell you that right now I feel the Holy Ghost and the angels of God are in this place. The Spirit of God is in this place. God is giving families and individuals an opportunity to take care of the most important business in their life, and that is their soul. Amen. 
God is giving people an opportunity to take care of business. And somebody says, but preacher, you don't understand how busy I am. And I'm going to tell you, what will that matter if this is the day that Jesus comes? Today, develop and take time to get to know Jesus Christ better than you've ever known him. Today, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you. How many? Oh, I don't need to be. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? 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 For the remission of sins. What's going to happen? You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Begin your escape today. You see, listen to me. The reason for doing the right thing today is tomorrow. That's the reason you need to do it today because tomorrow is coming. Don't let the devil, don't let circumstances leave you on the wrong side. We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted and in the day of salvation I have secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation.